Welcome back to session seven of the series of lessons on spiritual gifts. Those of you watching on DVD, we welcome you. And I'm very glad to have a fine group of people here in the classroom who are studying along with me. In the last session, we talked about verses 1 through 3 of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And the most important thing we learned is Paul said, do not be ignorant about spiritual gifts. Unfortunately, based on statistics, we found we today are just as ignorant about spiritual gifts as the Corinthians were back then. The other thing we learned is that we should not make our spiritual gift an idol. That all spiritual gifts are equally important. No spiritual gift is more essential than any other one. And so now we'll move on to the next session, uh, section of 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 through 3. In my country, we all enjoy watching American football. And I know that when you hear that word football, what you're thinking of is what we call the game of soccer. And it astounds me that America is the only place in the world where soccer is not popular. Although in the last World Cup, many people watched the games in the United States and I think there'll be many more people who enjoy it in the future. But I have a story I wish to tell you about American football. There is a very famous coach named Vince Lombardi. In fact, the trophy that's won by the best football team in America is called the Vince Lombardi Trophy. Well, he was the coach for a very small town in Wisconsin, which is just north of where I live in Illinois. The city is called Green Bay, and it is the smallest city that has any American football team as part of it. Well, Vince Lombardi, at the start of every season, would tell all of the football players to come and stand in a circle. And so you'd get these big guys who were 6'5", 300 pounds. They're all standing in a circle. And Vince Lombardi would have a football in the middle of the circle. And he would walk out, he would pick it up, and he would say, Gentlemen, this is a football. It would be like a football coach in soccer coming out and taking the soccer ball and going, gentlemen, this is a soccer ball. And what he meant was, we're going back to the basics. We're going to go right back to the start, and we are going to begin from there and then build on that foundation. And that's what Paul does in this next section of 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 3. He goes back to the basics, and he talks about the Trinity. So if you would open your Bibles along with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and I encourage those of you watching by DVD to please open your Bibles as well. You have the advantage of putting things on pause if there's something you wish to go back and review. We don't have that advantage here. Well, the Trinity seems like a very easy concept to understand. There's the Father, there's the Son, there's the Holy Spirit. That doesn't seem too hard. What makes it hard is all three of those are one. And that's where we go, huh? How can that be? How could three different distinct people be one? It doesn't compute in our minds. That's because our minds are limited. Our minds are finite. We can't understand the things that God understands. In the Bible, he says, my ways are not your ways. And that applies here. We do not understand the things of God in every sense of the word. There's a song that we sing called, Holy, Holy, Holy. God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Wonderful song, but when we sing it, I don't think we have a clue 
what the Trinity is really all about. They're just beautiful words. God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Amen. Well, let's go to a definition. There was an American pastor in the 20th century. Now he's with the Lord. But he gave what I think is a wonderful definition of the Trinity. And he wrote these words. The doctrine of the Trinity teaches that within the unity of one Godhead, there are three separate persons who are co-equal in power, nature, and identity. So if we take off the first part and we say, what's the definition? Within the unity of one Godhead, there are three separate persons who are co-equal in power, nature, and identity. Well, that doesn't exactly clear it up either. In fact, Martin Luther had a quote where he said, to try to deny the Trinity is to risk your salvation. To try to understand the Trinity is to risk your sanity. It's a difficult concept for us to understand. But one thing we can see in Scripture and throughout Scripture are examples where Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all work together in some aspect of a story. And the most important story is in Genesis chapter 1. And so, holding your finger here, I would ask you to turn in your Bible to Genesis chapter 1, the story of creation. And in this story, in the first chapter, we will actually see all three persons of the Godhead working together during the story. The very famous beginning of the story, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Probably the most famous beginning of any book ever written. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But in verse 2 it says, Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So in this initial day of creation, we have God who's doing the creating, but the Holy Spirit is also mentioned, hovering over what was then only water that was in the earth. And there's some thoughts by theologians that the Spirit of God was, in a sense, the protector of what we now call earth, ensuring that it would be good when it was created. And as we know, after each day of creation, the final statement, and God saw his work and it was good. So we see two of the three members of the Trinity involved there. Where Jesus was in this, I don't know. It's one of those secret things that I don't understand. I love Deuteronomy 29, 29. Secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever, that we may observe every word of the law. I take great comfort in the fact that there's lots in this, the Bible I'm not going to understand. I don't want to use that as an excuse, but it is true. It's an explanation. Now also in Genesis chapter 1, now turn to verse 26. And here we'll see all three members of the Trinity involved. This is the story of the creation of man. The great sixth day of creation. Where the final work, the crowning achievement of his creation is the creation of man and woman. And then on the seventh day he rests. But in this verse it said, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all crea uh, creatures that move along the ground. And in verse 27, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created them, Male and female, he created them. 
Well, you notice that I emphasize certain words there. Let us make man in our image. Would he have said, let me make man in my image? If there was just one Godhead himself? Who is he talking to when he says, let us? He's talking to the other members of the Trinity. Let us together make man and woman. And let's make man and woman in our image to resemble all of us. And God did make man and woman. And later he says, and it was good. So he, he also is active in the creation of man and woman. Now, turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, if you would, and you're all familiar with what we call today the Great Commission. In Matthew, uh, towards the end, in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, the verses that say, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. And then what does it say? baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. All three are a part of the Great Commission. They work together. They don't work separately. They're one Godhead. There is unity in the Trinity, and yet there is diversity in the Trinity. And it's the same with spiritual gifts. We have unity as the body of Christ. But we have diversity in that we have different gifts. So we are made in the likeness of God in the sense we come together in order to use our spiritual gifts to bless the body. But each of us works independently given our own functions and tasks. One final example that we do not have to go back because we know of it is Jesus' baptism. You remember, Jesus goes to John the Baptist, and John the Baptist says, Whoa, I should baptize you. You should baptize me. He recognizes that this man is the Son of God. And Jesus says, Let all things do be done according to Scripture. So Jesus goes down in the water, and he's baptized. And who appears? A spirit. Uh, the spirit of the dove comes down from heaven. The dove is the symbol of the Holy Spirit. And then what happens? A voice from heaven, from God the Father says, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. So in that one we see all of them working together. Jesus is being baptized. The Holy Spirit is coming down with a blessing and imbuing power on Jesus' work. And God is letting them know, this is my son, and I'm very pleased with them. So they all work together. While we continue being a benevolent project, your kind donations will continue to be vital in fulfilling the calling of TVS ministry. We do count on your gracious support and cooperation. For detailed information, please visit tvsseminary.com. Now, there have been several analogies that I have heard to help our finite minds understand spirit, uh, the concept of the Trinity? Think of an egg. What are the components of an egg? Well, there's the shell, there's the white, and there's the yolk. Three different parts. Which one's the egg? I've also heard the example of water. Water can appear in liquid state, it can be solidified, and if exposed to heat, it can become steam. Which of those is water? Three different forms, but one united concept of water. Just one more. Think of the earth. It's made up of land and water and the sky, the atmosphere. Which one is Earth? These are very feeble attempts to understand something that's very difficult, but I've always found them very helpful in understanding the Trinity. So 
when we think about the Trinity, we want to know, is this valid? Can this really be true? There is a uh, 19th century journalist, historian, philosopher, scientist named Henry Brooke Adams. He happens to be the grandson of one of our presidents, John Quincy Adams. And he's the great grandson of John Quincy Adams' father, John Adams. So he has some credibility in, in the United States and he writes, I tell you the solemn truth that the doctrine of the Trinity is not so difficult to accept as the working propositions of any of the axioms of physics. Let me repeat that. He says, here's the truth. The doctrine of the Trinity, it's as easy to accept as anything that we accept as the truth in physics. So after having studying it, looked at it, considering it from a philosophical, historic view, he says, we believe in physics and yet we can't see gravity. Why should we not believe in the Trinity and three separate persons in one Godhead when we can't see that? There are many things we can't see, yet we know they're there. Can you see love? You can see expressions of love, but can you actually see love? Do we believe there is love? Yes. Why? Because most of us at one time or another in life have experienced love. How do we know there's a Godhead when we can't see him? Because most of us as believers at some point in our Christian walk have experienced the Trinity and we know that it's real. Well, I have found over the years that it's very easy to understand the Trinity when we look at a triangle. Triangle has become kind of the universal symbol of God. All right? Now, you could think of God being at the very top, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and then all of it combined being the Godhead. Simple concept. But you know, this is also a concept that helps us explain the church and spiritual gifts. So let's take a look at how does that play out on this triangle. Well, let's say this is the Godhead, meaning Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And this is you and me. And this is others. And together, the Godhead with you and others forms the church. The church is not a building. The church is God's people. The church is you and I and all others who know and love Jesus Christ. Together, we are the church. So we are united with God. We are united with each other. Now, in terms of spiritual gifts, this becomes even more fascinating. Who's the source of spiritual gifts? Of course, it's God. In fact, it's the Holy Spirit who is the spiritual gift. So God gives us spiritual gifts. And I've just abbreviated it with the letters of each name. And then on the other side, God also gives others spiritual gifts. All right, we have spiritual gifts. Others who know Christ have spiritual gifts. Wonderful. What do we do with them? We serve each other. God has given us a spiritual gift, and we're supposed to serve the other people in the church. 
God has given them spiritual gifts to serve us. But it doesn't stop there. The triangle actually extends when we serve other people who are uh, unbelievers. And we try to, in our lives, reflect Jesus Christ as he lives his life through us, and so do others who reach out to unbelievers and share the gospel and believe in our hearts that someday God will answer that prayer and they will join the church and become one of us. To me, that helps understand in a simple way what is the Trinity? It's nothing more than God, us, others, together the church, God giving us spiritual gifts to serve one another and to reach out to our friends and neighbors and those who are near, far from God so that they might come near to God. In a sense, Jesus has given us his own mission to seek and save the lost. Well, let's go to the passage itself and see how the Trinity plays out here. Beginning with verse 4, it says, There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. Works all of them in all men. We see the Trinity. All right, we see the Spirit. We see then the Son, the Lord. And we see God the Father. And all of them have a role in spiritual gifts. See, none of the uh, members of the Trinity work in isolation. They never work alone. They always work together. And it is a reflection of how we are to serve. We are to serve together. You remember when Jesus sent the 12 out and later the 70 out on their own to minister? How did he tell them to go out? Two by two by two. You always minister with your brothers and sisters. I can't do this alone. There are people operating the cameras. There are students in the classroom. There are people in a control room. There are people in leadership of the Trinity Video Seminary. We are all working together for one common purpose so that you can learn about spiritual gifts and people around the world can learn about spiritual gifts. It's a wonderful thing when you look at the beauty of the church. So what is their role? All right, they each have a role and they're all working for a common purpose. Well, let's take a look. It says in verse uh, four, there are different gifts, but the same spirit. All right, we have the Spirit. His role is to give, actually to be, the different spiritual gifts. So he lives within us and then he expresses himself through ministry as a spiritual gift and he is the one that touches lives and draws them into the church and draws them closer to God. So that's his role. All right, and then we go on to Jesus' role. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. Well, the word service there is in the Greek, diakonia. Now, I want to assure everybody, I don't speak Greek. I never studied Greek, but I know how to use Bible study tools. And you should know, too. And there are two places on the internet that I would encourage everybody to use as a tool. One is uh, bluebible.org. It has as its basis the King James, but you can see what things are in the Greek and you can find out uh, what commentators think. The other one is biblegateway.com. That has multiple translations in many languages of the Bible. 
and it's a good way to compare, for example, literal translations with those that are paraphrases. So we can use tools. We don't have to go to seminary. God calls some people to go there. But he's also given us, especially through the wonders of technology, the Bible tools to understand the Bible for ourselves. Diakonia, for those of you who use Strong's Concordance, it's G1248. It means offices. Now, not like the office you work in. It means offices like the pastor, the teacher, the elder, different offices. So what's Jesus' role? He kind of places you where you should be in the body in different ministries, different offices that serve each other. The Holy Spirit's the gift. Jesus Christ places you exactly where you should be based on that gift. And now we come to the gift of the Father. The gift of the Father is, in the Greek, energima. And those of you using Strong's G1755, energima. What does that sound like? Energy. That's the role of God. And let's look at it in the verse. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. Working is translated as power, as energy. So when we look at the role of all the Godhead in spiritual gifts, they work in combination for one purpose, to build up the body of Christ, make it strong and healthy. God's role is to give you the energy to do it. Jesus' role is to place you in the right position so that you can use that energy to impact people. And the Holy Spirit is the gift. And when he manifests himself, when he makes himself known by the various spiritual gifts, then we touch people's lives. Well, I hope this has helped us understand a little more about a very difficult uh, concept. As Martin Luther said, if you deny it, you lose your salvation. But to try to understand it, you lose your sanity. And hopefully some of these analogies of the water and of earth and of an egg, the analogy of the triangle, that this will be helpful in understanding this difficult concept. Well, in the next session, we're going to talk about what exactly is a spiritual gift. And I hope you'll join us for that next session.